Good afternoon, or for some of you, I guess it may still be morning. Uh, I'm Lori Nandria. I'm a writer and an educator, uh, currently working as a substitute teacher in rural Western Maine, where I'm the secretary of the Maine Communist Party Club. I'm also a member of the CPUSA organization department, the Labor Commission, and the Working Class Think Tank. And I want to acknowledge that this presentation incorporates research and thinking from uh, several members of the think tank. Uh, this will focus on one segment of the US working class, that is uh, wage workers. And uh, that means workers who sell their labor power for a wage uh, typically uh, based on the hour or the day. Under that definition, about 55% of US workers fit into this category, and that includes uh, myself as a substitute teacher. I'm paid by the day, and then a wide range of other uh, industries and sectors, industrial workers, warehouse and transportation, office, construction and maintenance service workers, and also some gig workers and some agricultural workers. Now, I'm going to offer some uh, numbers and statistics, but I want to preface that with a caveat that it's easy to find income statistics, but we shouldn't necessarily trust them 100%. They fluctuate rapidly. They lag behind reality. Mm. Different organizations calculate them differently. The samples are flawed and limited. Um, but still, we can use them for comparisons and to give us a general idea of the landscape. So in March of 2023, the Bureau of Labor Statistics average or mean hourly wage for non-management private sector workers was $28.52. Now, you probably know that the average is calculated by taking all the wages and adding those up and dividing them by the number of workers. Um, the median is if you line up all the incomes and take the middle income, you get the median. And the median for that same period was $27.50 which means that more workers are making the lower wages, um, but there are enough workers making the higher wages to kind of pull the average up. Uh, now, uh, again, uh, same study, the range of wages is, mm -hmm. is huge, very wide, ranging from $7.93 to $66.11. And of course, the wages vary across sectors, industries, and also states and regions of the country. Um, if you look at the graph, uh, I tried to illustrate that approximately 25% of workers make $15 or less approximately 50% make between $16 and $33, and approximately 25% make more than $33. So to put this another way, about 75% of wage workers make less than $33 an hour. And you can use MIT's living wage calculator that's online, easy to find and use, to check what's called the living wage for different places, how much somebody needs to make in order to meet the basic costs of living. And according to that calculator, there are very few places in the country where $33 an hour, even that top of the 75%, $33 an hour would be a living wage for a single parent with one child. And as Dee had referenced earlier, you know, this seems to be, you know, one of the um, largest uh, groups of people who are living in poverty, especially single women with one child. And by the same token, there are very few places in the country 
where $15 an hour would meet expenses even just for a single adult with no children working full time. So that chunk of, you know, a range of wages that 75% of wage workers make is generally not enough. And I'm sure this isn't news to anyone. Um, uh, you know, even if, you know, $33 sounds like, you know, kind of a substantial wage in most urban areas, uh, it's not a meeting expenses. But something we also want to keep in mind is that workers who are making middle and higher wages um, are exploited also. They are exploited also. And as earlier presenters have indicated, you know, when the capitalists are taking the value that a worker is creating, even if a worker is making a high wage, um, that value that is being stolen from them means that they are being exploited also. I want to talk about two, uh, two additional factors that sort of characterize our, our moment. Um, since 1979, wages have gone up. On paper, they've gone up, but their purchasing power has not. Um, uh, today's real average wage, that means the wage after accounting for inflation, has about the same purchasing power that it had in 1979. What real wage gains there have been have mostly gone to the highest paid uh, salaried employees, basically managers and executives. This past year alone, the average wage has risen about 4.7%. It finally responded a little bit to the pressures brought by historically low unemployment. But even now, the real wage is not really up because of such steep rises in food, housing, and healthcare costs. And you can look at those percentage. Housing costs have increased by 31% and healthcare costs since 2000 by 55%, which is just a breathtaking rise, while wages since 2000 have only increased by 10.4%. So no one is coming out ahead. Um, you know, in, in this category, uh, everybody is uh, losing losing ground. And an April 2023 poll, a really big, big uh, poll, showed that 81% of workers who responded said their wages have not kept up with the rising cost of living. So that's one issue, wage st stagnation, not keeping up with inflation. But also, since the 70s, wages have not increased with productivity. Between 1979 and 2021, productivity rose 64.6%, while the hourly wage rose only 17.3%. That's a really important fact to consider. Um, it means that workers have been producing far more than they are being compensated for in their paychecks and benefit packages. As Marx foresaw, improvements in the mode of production mean that more can be made in less time with less labor, and we call that automation. And in a socialist economy, that would be great for everyone it would mean that we could produce easily, right? The necessities of life, uh, get those to everyone uh, with less, uh, less time spent on labor, meaning people can have more leisure, more time with their families, for hobbies, for the arts, sports, right? All the, all the wonderful things, but in our capitalist system, of course, it doesn't work that way. All the fruits of economic growth are going to the highest paid uh, uh, salaried managers, but mostly they're just converted into profits 
that are distributed to the owners, the CEOs, the shareholders, and other capitalists. And so that, that huge gap, that huge jump in productivity and that tiny jump in wages has greatly accelerated wealth and income inequality in our time. Um, and again, uh, we want to note that increased labor productivity without a proportional increase in pay equals increased exploitation even if the worker is being highly paid, being paid a high hourly wage, um, right? Exploitation, as Dee pointed out, applies to every worker who creates value that is appropriated uh, by the capitalists. So in short, both wage stagnation and the productivity gap are affecting workers in all income ranges, though they are certainly affecting most painfully uh, the, the workers at the low uh, lower end of the wage scale. Now, as we know, all workers are exploited on the job. Surplus value is extracted from them to realize profits. Women and people of color are super exploited, meaning more of the value they produce is taken from them, taken by the capitalists. So uh, here are some very recent averages. Uh, in the first quarter of 2023, women who worked full-time in wage and salary jobs had median, median earnings about 84% of men's earnings. In male-dominated industries, such as natural resources and construction, women earned on average 65.9% of men's earnings. And that is not even considering the amount of unpaid labor in the home that has traditionally uh, and still very often uh, falls on, on women. Uh, likewise, uh, recent studies show that nationwide, black workers earn on average 76 cents per white workers dollar and Latino workers 73 cents. Latina women earn on average 53 cents and black women on average 63 cents for every dollar a white a male earns. And again, we want to think about this in, in uh, Marxist terms. If we have, you know, a, a, a woman uh, working maybe in a picture framing shop and a, a man uh, working beside her, um, it, the uh, owner of the, uh, of the uh, factory, of the, the picture framing factory is keeping more of the value that the woman produces uh, than uh, the man uh, standing standing next to her. Um, now, recently, these gaps had shrunk some. Um, they're still just shockingly large gaps. They had shrunk some. And in part, we want to recognize that mass struggle has won progress. Uh, the fight for 15, Black Lives Matter, um, you know, some uh, progress has been, been won through struggle and also through the tight uh, labor market. But economists have pointed out that recent interest rate rises could easily uh, wipe out these gains. Um, the earlier presenters have made, I think, a very uh, well uh, this point about the um, way that um, division in the working class, uh, which are um, purposefully cultivated and exacerbated by the ruling class, um, function to um, weaken the working class's organizational abilities um, and, you know, um, uh, keep uh, the working class from unifying ag against uh, the capitalists. Um, we know that there are these real inequalities, for example, between men and women that we've just looked at, uh, between uh, workers of, of different races and ethnicities, 
Um, but these get translated by a ruling class ideology into false perceptions of threat, uh, rather than understanding that these inequalities are bad for everyone um, and are the fault of capitalism. Uh, they are translated into uh, antagonism, right, in, inside and outside of the workplace uh, between different groups and a kind of a belief that the other group will take what should be um, belong to us. Um, and this is, I think, an important question uh, for us as, as the party uh, to keep asking, you know, how do we help people see that capitalism, um, not the other working class group, is the real threat and the real thief? Um, you know, as we as we know, uh, the fascist element of the capitalist class uh, constantly works to divide uh, the working class by manufacturing crises. Uh, and often, recently, we see um, trans people demonized, and you know, there um, these uh, issues like gender neutral bathrooms being used to divide communities, divide working class communities, as well as other differences like race, uh, Im immigration status, and rural versus urban. Uh, where I live in a rural area, I see that very clearly. I see it especially around election times. And, you know, it may, it's something that I think it's important to think about the rural versus urban um, division in the working class, it tends to get entwined with other kinds of, of bigotries. Um, but in, in rural areas, uh, working class people sometimes, you know, fall into thinking of the urban area near them as this sort of hotbed of, um, you know, un-Americanism, right? People who don't, um, people who have accents, who eat strange food and soak up public resources. And there comes to be this sort of enmity, right, between the working class in one area, even working very similar jobs in similar interests, industries, and the working class in the, the urban area. And this is a quote that I think is very nicely captures this attitude on the part of the rural working class, who are always at risk of, of sliding to the right. Um, the state is not seen as their own. It is not of them. Rather, it destroys the thing that is of them. Uh, it overregulates, breaks promises, um, and in, in general, there there is um, you know a sense on the part of, of rural people of this disenfranchisement um, by by their uh, their by their own government that is not always wrong. Um, but is uh, the blame is often wrongly placed. Um, speaking of elections, um, at the ballot box, a very large recent study uh, published uh, in uh, Jacobin um, found that uh, with wage workers, uh, pretty specifically, economic issues tend to unite wage workers across party lines. Um, social issues tend to divide. Um, uh, but um, wage workers, even wage workers who identify as Republican, often are economic populists. And this seems to be a good thing for us to really think about you know, sort of what we can do with, with that uh, fact, um, how we can perhaps use the um, often anti-corporatism of the rural working class to um, help raise uh, class consciousness of that group. And then turning to the question of quality of life um, among wage workers, uh, as earlier presenters have pointed out, there has been a tendency to use educational attainment as a marker of class. And this is terribly faulty. It is a terrible way to, to measure class. Um, but this big influential study of deaths of despair, 
many of you have probably seen those results. Um, it has shown that, that in general, deaths of despair in the US, and that includes alcohol, drugs, or suicide, have soared, but they have especially risen quickly uh, among those without a college degree. And that, you know, um, uh, attempt to measure uh, the working class. Uh, they have gone from roughly five or 10 per 100,000 to well over 100 per 100,000 people. It is a, just a sobering uh, rise. Causes include financial problems, unpredictable and irregular schedules. This has gotten so much worse with automation and is becoming a more and more important demand uh, among unions and other organizing workers. And also importantly, the lack of structure and meaning in life, including at work. And I think it's not a, you know, it's not very controversial to assert that human beings need a sense of belonging. They need a sense of meaning and purpose. And that one of the many downsides to capitalism is that it makes it almost impossible for workers to get these rewards at their work. I have uh, worked with many organizing workers in Amazon in North Carolina, and I've had the privilege of having telephone conversations or in, over coffee with hundreds of, of Amazon workers. And often they say they came into it wanting to love that job. They were psyched about working for Amazon. They, they loved the cutting edge technology. You know, they wanted to be part of it. And Amazon just relentlessly made it impossible just by treating them with disrespect, by abusing them, not caring about injuries, not caring about safety, underpaying, you know, all the ways um, that had made it just, just impossible for them to find that sense of pride and meaning uh, as at, at, at work until uh, they started organizing. And I want to just make the point in closing here that union membership and any kind of working organizing is an important avenue for finding, for workers to find the sense of pride and purpose specifically uh, in the workplace. Um, I love this quote from Sam Smith, who was one of uh, three uh, Chipotle workers who uh, got together in Michigan and succeeded in organizing the first Chipotle ever to, uh, to unionize. Um, and it, it really reflects, I think, the extent to which she was motivated partly by just a desire to, um, to achieve, do something meaningful. Um, you know, as she uh, uh, puts it, even before getting involved in the union drive, she knew she wanted to make some kind of difference in the world. And that being involved in the union drive and then in, you know, uh, 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 representing workers in the union um, has um, not only uh, won better wages and safety protections and some control over schedules, um, but also has uh, sort of brought this sense of meaning and this experience th with collective action that's so important. Um, later presentations, uh, later in the week, I believe on Tuesday night, maybe another next weekend, uh, will deal in more detail with uh, the labor movement. But I want to briefly make the connection here um, to uh, this question of class consciousness and specifically among wage workers. Uh, we know that unions succeed in winning higher wages, better benefits, safety protections. Uh, for us as communists, it's also important that workplace struggle exposes the real conflict in interest between workers and capitalists. The workplace struggle reveals the mechanics of exploitation. And workplace organizing is a crucial locus for building work, working class power solidarity and class consciousness. Last year in 2022, unions added 200,000 members. There was a 55% increase in the number of union representations filed at the NLRB and a 52% increase in the number of strikes. 
and as we're looking around us today, um, you know, the witnessing the Teamsters action, the UAW strike, uh, the um, uh, uh, SAG-AFTRA and writer skilled strikes, uh, it may very well be be higher uh, this year. Um, and um, the the coverage of these strikes were um, has generally been, I, I, I'll have to say, I've been a little disappointed in the last few days in the UAW's media coverage. But in general, I think that the media coverage has been very positive, um, that, that um, there's a chance here for some welcome, positive representation of the working class. And that uh, my final point here um, is that we need more positive representation of the working class. Um, as the earlier presenters have mentioned, many working class people are fooled about capitalism, about collective action, um, about socialism. Um, they have been misled by um, crazy ways of defining class uh, through income, through blue versus white collar, etc. And a, a lot of misleading media representations. You know, if you think about television, music, film, art, books, and we think about, you know, how the working class is represented, um, you know, especially on television, and maybe people will think, oh, well, that's just television, you know, who, who cares? But you know, often television and film, popular culture, these are ways that people form their ideas about how the world works beyond their immediate acquaintance, right? Beyond their immediate observation. And, you know, we have just been inundated with the message that power and success equals wealth, that the working class is the place of failure. It's a place of lack, lack of ambition. If you're working class, you're supposed to want to climb your way out of it, right, to get somewhere else. Um, rarely do you see um, the positive representations of working class uh, values and working class culture. Um, uh, moreover, uh, we see constant negative representations of um, collectivity, for example, uh, being associated with oppression, with stupidity, mob mentality. Um, you can think of all the anti-communist propaganda that we see about China or North Korea, where you see these sort of big masses of people made to look like robots acting in concert. Or in fiction, think of Star Trek, the Borg, right, where this uh, representation of, of what could be such an interesting collective is transformed into something where you're made to be not human anymore. And I think it's good to, for us to pay attention uh, to the mass media and to draw attention when there is some kind of positive and, and really realistic, um, empowering representation of the working class, or perhaps we need to produce them. So these are the questions that I would uh, leave us with. How can we fight the ruling class culture's equation of working class with um, failure? Um, Marx and Engels don't define the working class uh, primarily in terms of failure or deprivation, but rather in terms of power and potential. Um, and how can we help others see that as workers, uh, we are all exploited by the system that isn't good for people or the planet, and there is an alternative besides apocalypse, the one everybody seems to think of. No, there is an alternative, it's socialism. And that labor struggles can lead to class and socialist consciousness. You know, even if a union vote does not succeed, if it, su it does not win, if it succeeds in raising people's class consciousness, it, it is a win uh, for the working class. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Lori. We'll now take a few minutes to set for our next presenter, Taryn. Hi, my name is Taryn. I am in the Queens Club. And thank you so much for uh, the other presentations today. They've been great. I can see that there are a lot of points 
uh, that are sort of overlapping in each of the presentations. And I think one of the more important points is uh, building working class unity, you know, and I think that the most important way that we can set about tackling that is to first really deeply examine like the nature of uh, the US working class and, and figure out, you know, how to go about it scientifically, as others have mentioned. So um, I will be covering, I'll be doing my best to cover uh, this topic on low wage workers uh, for the collective. Okay, so first we should start off by asking ourselves who qualifies as a low wage worker. And I like this graphic here because you can see how this idea of like middle income is kind of ridiculous or middle class, right? Because here in the New York, Newark, New Jersey area, uh, you would have to be making between $56,000 and $169,000 to be considered middle class. Now, I don't make $56,000, but I would assume that between $56,000 and $169,000, there's a huge, you know, uh, disparity in lifestyles there, right? Especially if you have children. Uh, but you can see here how this goes all the way up to 221,000 in the DMV area. So yeah, this is a big gap between different types of wages for you to be considered like comfortable. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that people are counting low wage workers. I was looking at a couple of different studies, uh, but some of the ways that they do it is for people who work who make less than $20 an hour as waged labor. A family of three making less than about $40,000 per year would be considered uh, low wage. And according to the Social Security Administration, uh, which keeps track of wages because obviously we pay into uh, social security through our paychecks. Uh, the average worker in the United States makes $60,575 a year. And the median wage is $37,586 a year. So when we're thinking about the differences between averages and like median, we can think, okay, so you take the, the highest wages and the lowest wages and you, and you sort of mix them all together and you come up with an average, right? Whereas the median wage is you're looking at everybody making money on a spectrum and figuring out who is in the middle. Uh, and so the middle would be considered low wage. Now, um, I know I don't know exactly what uh, resources Lori were, uh, was using, but when I was looking at this, it looked as though more than 50% of the US population would be considered uh, low wage workers at this rate. Uh, they might be salaried, they might not be getting time wages, you know, per hour wages, but uh, but they would be mostly considered low wage workers. But first, before we continue, we need to think about why it is that we even care about wages as a society. Uh, money is considered one of the greatest fetishes, right? So Marx describes a fetish as something that is concealing something else behind it, right? And so when I'm looking at a dollar, or I'm looking at a quarter, uh, I'm looking at paper that has printing on it and it's got some words on it, but what I'm really looking at is something that is backed with the power of the state, right? That's why I can't just go and start counterfeiting my own money um, because that's against the law because it's not backed by the power of the state, right? So what you are seeing in that dollar is many, many different facets of control. Uh, money, gives you access, right? Without money, you can't live. You can't pay your wage, sorry, you can't pay your rent, you can't buy groceries, you can't access healthcare, you can't access education. Without money, you're in big trouble under capitalism. Also, there's a connection between money and power, right? So I think I could do more push-ups than Elon Musk, but because he's got, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, he's technically got more power than me, even though you know, I, I don't really like recognize that, but it's just because of that money that he comes off as being more powerful. Uh, and yeah, we need money to live. And so the way that the majority of us get money is by working. And so because that money is tied to our life, we have a very dependent kind of relationship with our employer. Uh, wages are paid out for your time, not for the value that you are producing. Um, and I appreciated Lori's comment on how even workers who are making very, very high wages, they might actually still be overexploited or hyperexploited because maybe somebody's making, you know, $90,000 a year as a programmer, but if they didn't write those computer programs, 
some big bank wouldn't be able to realize, you know, billions of dollars worth of value. And so obviously, even though that person's making like higher wages than, than average, uh, they're still being like super exploited. Uh, and as, as Marx sort of writes in Capital Chapter 10, uh, moments are the elements of profit. So because money is connected to uh, your time at work, your boss is tr constantly trying to intensify whatever it is that you're producing, whether that's making you go faster or making you somehow more efficient. Maybe you have a technological change that you're taking advantage of in your production. Uh, but the, the boss, the capitalist's job is to try and get as much profit as humanly possible out of whatever it is that you're doing. And so sometimes that's why you have, you know, questions about clocking in and clocking out, right? If you clock in a minute early, you're considered to be stealing time from your boss. But if you uh, clock in a, a minute late, you're also considered to be stealing time from your boss because those minutes add up over the year. And that's like big money in the capitalist's pocket. From Capital Chapter 23, the maintenance and reproduction of the working class remains a necessary condition for the reproduction of capital, right? So obviously in order for capitalism to operate, it needs to have workers. Uh, but the capitalist may safely leave this to the workers drive for self-preservation and propagation. All the capitalist cares for is to reduce the workers' individual consumption to the necessary minimum, right? So there's a difference. When you have wages, right, your housing, your food no longer becomes your boss's responsibility, right? It's your responsibility as a worker, which is kind of whack if you think about it, because if you're not eating, if you're not, you know, sleeping, then you show up to work and you're doing a really bad job. Like, obviously, the boss needs to have healthy, well-rested workers, uh, but at the same time, they're driven by this, uh, force towards profit to, to try and maximize the amount of time and energy that they're extracting from you. And so that means that they're going to try and whittle you down to the necessary minimum of consumption for you to survive and get up to go to work the next day. Uh, and this is important when we're talking about low wages, right? Uh, because we can see already that most people, even though they might be working 40, 50 hours a week, are hardly able to be able to sustain themselves. Uh, but this is not what the boss would consider to be uh, their responsibility. <laughs> they think it's up to you. It's like you're poor because uh, you don't save your money correctly, or you're poor because of this, that, and the other thing. Not that you're poor because we are underpaying you. Capital asks no questions about the length of life of labor power. What interests it is purely and simply the maximum of labor power that can be set in motion on a working day. It attains this objective by shortening the life of labor power in the same way as a greedy farmer snatches more produce from the soil by robbing it of its fertility. Now, I love capital, obviously. I love Karl Marx. He can write really, really well sometimes. And I think that this image that he's conjuring up for us of over-exploiting the soil as a farmer, like, yeah, you're going to get a lot out of it, uh, if you're over exploiting it, but after a couple seasons, it's not going to be as fertile anymore. Now, if you were a landowner, you would care about this, right? Uh, because you don't want to be sitting on a bunch of land that can't grow anything. But if you are a boss, if you're a capitalist, you don't really care if you're robbing the soil of its fertility because there are many other people standing in line waiting to get a job, right? So you can use this one up, throw it away, use another one up, throw it away. It's not really like the boss's concern whether or not you have a happy, long, healthy, productive life. They literally just care about the time when you're on the clock and how much money you are making them. And I like this from Capital Chapter 15. This was always an image that really, really stood out to me. And it sort of sums up a lot of this low wage uh, conversation here. When we think about in England, women are still occasionally used as horses for the hauling barges because the labor required to produce horses and machines is an accurately known quantity while that required to maintain the woman of the surplus population is beneath all calculation hence we nowhere find a more shameless squandering of humor labor power for the despicable purposes than in england the land of machinery i like to bring this up when people are talking to me about automation uh, because I like to remind people that human beings are actually cheaper than robots. They're cheaper than machines in a lot of circumstances. But you have to create 
a class of people, sorry, not you, but capitalism necessitates a class of people, here Marx is describing it as a surplus population, that are willing to work for substandard wages, that are forced to work for substandard wages. If you study the history of the development of capitalism, you'll see that like most workers were not keen on this arrangement. They much would much rather uh, you know, go out and hunt in the Lord's woods. They would much rather take their water from the river. They would much rather just like squat in a hut in the middle of, of nowhere. Uh, they wanted to be vagabonds, but they wanted to be poachers, but those things became punishable by death. So there was a, a, a refusal of letting people opt out of this uh, scenario. And you can see that today. It's like, I can't just go to the store and start filling up my bag with groceries. I have to pull out money and pay for it. If I don't do that, then somebody calls the cops on me and then I go to jail. So this is how people are coerced into these situations is that you require money to live. And so you're forced into situations where you might have to take on low wage labor to survive. So who is it that belongs in the surplus population in the United States? We're looking at low wage workers, right? Um, but here I've got a photo up of a homeless encampment in Washington, DC. When we've got bosses looking at their workforce and they want to pay them the absolute minimum possible for the maximum amount of work that they can get out of someone, you have a boss looking at a human being as a worker, right? Now, bosses or capitalists, sorry, also view humans as consumers. So you have this sort of like weird duality where people are both workers and they're also consumers, right? They go to the work every day, they produce stuff, uh, they're exploited, and then they take their wages, which is a portion of what it is that they've created that is magnanimously gifted back to them by the by the capitalist and they go to the supermarket and they buy stuff right so on one hand you have capitalists who want to keep wages and people's standard of living very very low like in the minimum you know the, the, the smallest amount possible to keep people showing up to work every day but also you have capitalists who want people to spend lots and lots and lots of money on stuff right and so there's a contradiction that emerges between these two ways that uh, the capitalists are looking at us. They don't really care about us sustaining ourselves as workers. They say, whatever, I paid you a wage, that's your business, how you're going to uh, stay alive with that wage. But they still want our money as consumers. Um, okay, so we to keep buying the commodity services we produce so they can continue to make profits. Now, oftentimes this is something that will push capitalism into crisis, right? Uh, because if people can't go out and buy stuff, then they are, no longer able to keep factories open, the profits are declining, et cetera. There's right now in the United States a situation where uh, economists are stressing out about the fact that people my age are not buying houses, right? Are not starting families uh, because buying a house and starting a family, there's a lot of consumptive activity that's going on there. But at the same time, lots of people my age are making wages that are so small that people don't feel like they're able to buy a house or they're not able to buy a house or not they're not able to sustain a family right so you can kind of see this contradiction emerge on like a grander scale uh in the capitalist economy today but people who are unable to buy things for one reason or another become part of a surplus population they become expendable basically that's who it is that is going to prison that's who it is that's making substandard wages um, these are people who are now part of a surplus population, like the person it is who is living in this tent. The surplus population is also sometimes referred to as the reserve army of labor. Uh, we need to expand our view of low wage workers, right? So low wage workers are not necessarily just people making, you know, $7.25 or $15 an hour. Uh, they're also people who are making technically no money at all right so the unemployed will we call the unemployed a low-wage worker yeah we would especially if you're on benefits because no matter what it is that you are doing if you're unemployed you still need a way to, to to pay your rent so whether that means that you're on benefits or you're working off the books or something the unemployed still count as part of the surplus population uh, and the higher unemployment rates are right the lower wages become 
because they figure that people who are unemployed are willing to settle for less when it comes to their wages because they so desperately need a job in order to live. The incarcerated are also called a, sorry, are also part of the reserve army of labor. Talk about low wage workers. Uh, technically that's the one population in this country that you can still force to work and not pay them any money at all. Uh, prisoners are sometimes paid upwards of like, you know, 10 cents an hour, 25 cents an hour, uh, but they're doing actual productive labor at the same time. You know, in New York State, for instance, uh, each state institution is required to see whether or not they can supply, sorry, they can source stuff like soap dispensers, desks, chairs, et cetera, from prison labor before they're able to go and buy it from like a furniture store because the implication there is that it will be cheaper because you obviously don't have to pay incarcerated people as much money. Uh, they're very cheap labor. Anyway, I always put this in the context of, well, if you wanted to open up a union shop in New York uh, that manufactured desks, you wouldn't be able to compete with this reserve army of labor that is making so much less money than you, uh, basically doing work at gunpoint for free, you wouldn't be able to compete in a capitalist marketplace with these, uh, with this population. The undocumented also. So I was very pleased to see this week that um, the federal government is handing or is giving out 500,000 work permits to Venezuelans, right? Now, obviously we want everybody who's here to have work permits and we don't want them to be temporary. We want them to be for good. Uh, and the reason for that is not just because I believe in open borders, but also because if you have a population of people who are in this country, who are undocumented, who are afraid of you know, the police catching them and then deporting them, they're afraid of bad things happening to them, you can force them to work at sub-minimum wage off the books, right? So not only is the boss not paying into Social Security for them, uh, they're also paying these workers a uh, substandard sub-minimum wage, right? But if they have the legal right to work, then they are able to, they're, they're protected by law, right? So now they have to make minimum wage. If you have a population of workers who are making less than minimum wage, again, like we've got the unemployed, the incarcerated, the undocumented, that's going to drive down uh, wages across the board, right? These people are existing as a reserve army of labor. Also reproductive workers. What do I mean by reproductive workers? Well, as we saw a couple slides ago, uh, workers need to sustain themselves, right? And so that means people who are taking care of children, that means people who are taking care of the sick or the elderly, that means people who are cooking your dinner or washing your clothes. Those people are reproductive workers and some of them are waged, right? So people can send out their laundry to be done professionally, they can order on DoorDash or whatever. Uh, but a lot of reproductive workers aren't actually paid anything and those people are generally women. That's why you have this feminization of labor uh, which basically says that that certain jobs, like for instance in uh, healthcare industry, certain jobs that involve like taking care of people's physical needs are paid less than other jobs in the healthcare sector because it's seen more as like women's work, right? It, because there is a whole section of the population that is doing this reproductive work for free, uh, you end up driving down wages in areas where it is waged, basically, where people are not working for free. The point, it, the, the point I really want to get across in this, because I, I don't know, I, I think I'm coming up on my time, uh, but the point I really want to get across is that we are all expendable, right? As workers, to capitalists, we are all expendable, right? Life under capitalism is pay to play. If you don't have money, then you do not have the right to live in this country, in this economy. You don't have the right to live. Of course you have the right to live, but I'm saying from the capitalist perspective, you're just sort of a drain, right? You're, you're someone who's living under a bridge somewhere. Uh, they don't care if you have cancer and you can't afford health care. They don't really care. If you don't have the money, then like you can't live in this country. While capitalists and workers are human beings, right? We're all just human beings. Uh, we are thrust into our relative positions by the immutable laws of capital, right? So even if you have a capitalist who's a very nice person, they're still gonna have to seek to exploit the maximum amount from their workers uh, if not, then they go out of business, right? Somebody else is going to do that and they're gonna outcompete them. So even if they're like a nice person, uh, they're still gonna be exploiting their workers. Likewise, 
if you're a worker, you have a personality, you have an individuality, but you're not able to express that under capitalism because at the end of the day, you're a worker. I used to do an exercise with students where I would say, you know, who are you? Are you a worker or a consumer? And most of them would always say like consumers because that is the avenue under capitalism where we're supposed to uh, seek out our individuality. Again, it's pay to play. Like if you wanna get the nice shoes, if you wanna get the good video games, you gotta have the, the, the money for this. But they would consider themselves to be like their real selves outside of working hours when actually their working hours are what's taking up the majority of their life on this planet. So how is it that you have people sort of separating themselves, uh, how it is that they view themselves? Anyway, uh, under capitalism, we're not individuals, but are encouraged to think of ourselves as individuals. So even though we're all workers, we're all in the same situation together. Uh, we don't see ourselves as like one big working class, uh, which is a problem. Obviously, all of us on the call feel differently about that. But I think one of the main goals of the working class think tank is to try and get people uh, in a wider sense able to understand themselves as part of this broader class of people. Uh, because according to communism, according to Marx, uh, we're never going to be able to fully recognize ourselves as like unique individuals until we are no longer held under the laws of capitalism. We're encouraged likewise to divide ourselves by gender, race, nationality, and also wage, right? So I know there was a there was a comrade earlier who was asking about imperialism and do workers in the United States not benefit from imperialism or do they benefit from imperialism? And I think I actually taught a class a couple years ago on this very uh, topic but it doesn't really matter if you're working at a Verizon store making $14 per hour or manufacturing the phone in Thailand for $2 per hour, we are all one working class. And you can kind of bring that back to looking at how $2 an hour in Thailand and $14 an hour in New York is really just not enough to live, right? Um, even though you can look at the number difference and how much you're getting paid per hour, what we're really talking about here, again, because money is is a fetish, uh, what we're really talking about here is your ability to live, your access to things that you need in order to survive. And the CPUSA is the vehicle for building working class unity and realizing our collective power as the working class. Like I think it's just a really important project and this is the party that's going to be able to do that, right? That has been working on it historically and will continue to do so. Because I think nowadays, especially, there are so many questions about workers and wages uh, and people can kind of get a little bit confused. You know, you can get sidetracked by questions of, you know, well, for instance, you know, do workers in, in the United States benefit from imperialism or not? Like this is, you know, of course, it's, a, it's an important question to explore. But it's also in some circumstances a bit of a red herring, right? Because we're again going back to the things that are uh, dividing us, that the capitalists have put on top of us, right? And if we can't really like adequately unpack what these divisions mean, uh, then we won't be able to, to move forward. So uh, that's what I've got. And I look forward to questions that people might have. Thank you, Taryn. Cheers. All right, uh, Scott. Um, let's see, I'm going to make you a presenter, even though you don't, you're not going to show slides. So we have one more, uh, brief presentation and then we'll open the floor for discussion. Scott. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, and, uh, thank you to the, the two previous presenters in this, um, in this section. Uh, the, those, uh, both were, were really, uh, rich and informative. Uh, presentations. This one is going to be something more in the way of um, uh, posing a question or an invitation to a, a discussion about professional workers um, or um, professionals in the working class or, or um, however we want to term it. Um, so when we talk about uh, professionals, well, I think I'll start actually with the definition of professional given in the National Labor Relations Act. Um, so professional uh, work, as it's described um, there, is, um, and I'm quoting, uh, predominantly intellectual and varied in character, as opposed to routine, mental, manual, mechanical, or physical work. It is uh, involving the consistent exercise of discretion and judgment in its performance. 
uh, of such a character that the output produced or the result accomplished cannot be standardized in relation to a given period of time, requiring knowledge of an advanced type in a field of science or learning customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction and study in an institution of higher learning or a hospital as distinguished from a general academic education or from an apprenticeship or from training in the performance of routine mental, manual, or physical processes. Um, so that definition doesn't do a whole lot for me um, because I sat down, so I've, a little background on me. I've worked in kind of a lot of different uh, places. I worked in fast food. I was a um, flagger on a road construction crew. Um, I was a, a university professor. I was a, a teacher in the um, public schools in Chicago. Uh, I uh, worked in a print shop, both in the kind of shop production end and in the, the typesetting and layout end. Um, so I've kind of been on both sides of, of this. And this, the definition does not, to me, feel like a, like a solid one. Um, so we're told, for example, that professional work is intellectual um, and varied uh, versus routine, mechanical, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, we're told that it takes specialized education as opposed to apprenticeship, um, that there's flexible time for tasks as opposed to standardized time for tasks. And um, it sounds like someone trying to draw a distinction that's, that really has no business being drawn in a lot of cases. If we think of professional jobs, we're talking about writers, teachers, uh, doctors, nurses, lawyers, uh, and for doctors and lawyers, people who aren't in private practice, right? Um, you're not a worker uh, if you own a private practice, or you're not a member of the working class if you own a private practice. Um, uh, people in a lot of jobs in communications and marketing and design and research, um, the people who are uh, walking the the WGA uh, picket lines, um, those are those are professional workers. Um, on the other side, non-professional, uh, you might think of people in construction, uh, manufacturing and assembly, transportation, uh, custodial work, retail, uh, child care, food service. Um, and when I think about these jobs and my experiences in in both of them. Um, I, yeah, like trying to draw the line, for example, between the work of a, a nurse and the work of an electrician um, on the grounds that one, you know, uh, went to college and the other went through an apprenticeship. Um, both engage in um, both physical and intellectual labor. Uh, both use discretion and judgment to a very high degree. Um, I don't think, in fact, there's any job where workers are not called upon uh, to uh, use their minds in addition to their bodies, um, uh, where tasks uh, are, in, where the time for tasks is standardized uh, because nothing ever works like it's supposed to. Um, so I want to just start there, kind of by by calling into question this um, distinction that is often offered as a very solid one, right between um, different kinds of um, work that's done. Um, we could say on the professional side that a lot of these jobs, um, uh, medicine, law, um, teaching, research, are things that were not originally part of the working class back when Marx was writing, um, but that Marx foresaw becoming part of the working class. And D gave that, D gave that great quote from the uh, the manifesto about how the poet and the the priest and and, and so forth become the paid wage laborers uh, of of capital, and that's what we've seen. We've seen a massive process of proletarization. So um, a physician, for example, my wife is a doctor, and um, the reality of her work is um, increasing speed up, more and more patients uh, pushed into um, shorter and shorter times. Um, uh, you know, work that is um, increasingly kind of um, under surveillance and 
um, enforced sort of rigid forms of collaboration, right? things that are traditionally associate, associated with um, non-professional jobs. And this, this is a kind of across the board thing. Um, it happens uh, for uh, research and teaching in universities, the, the casualization of academic labor, the, the elimination of, of tenure, and the move toward um, less and less secure forms there. Um, the, the attack on tenure for public school teachers. Um, so the, the, the long and short of it is that, um, you know, not obviously not all professional people or not all professionals are members of the working class, but a lot of what is labeled as professional falls in fact under the same kinds of exploitation and the same conditions that um, the rest of the working class faces. And to get specific about that, you know, we might think about what does overwork look like? Uh, well, on the one side, you might have uh, speed up during the working day. If you work a, a working day of a, a standardized length, um, you know, you're supposed to be working 8.30 to 4.30 or whatever, um, your boss can try to cram more work into that time. Or there might be forced overtime, right, where you don't get to choose whether you take it or not might have an irregular schedule. Um, on the other side, uh, in the professional uh, section of the working class, it's more likely to be uh, unpaid overtime, what's sometimes called pajama time, where you take work home. There's no real distinction anymore between the workplace and uh, the rest of your life. That, that boundary just gets kind of uh, erased. Um, uh, in terms of the enforced rigid uh, coordination of labor that uh, capitalism imposes. Well, um, for a worker on an assembly line, it's the machines that ensure that that coordination, right? The the progress of a, of a thing down the line. Um, on the other end, um, in an office setting or among, you know, the so-called professional section, it's more likely to be a software platform uh, where collaboration is is under very strict surveillance where everything is recorded and reported um, there's uh, constant meetings constant updates of your of your progress um, that serves exactly the same function of coordinating uh, our work for the benefit of of capitalism uh, if we think about automation obviously um, you know a ton of working class uh, jobs have been uh, made insecure that way and the new round of you know, with with AI um, is going to do the same thing to a lot of professional jobs, especially in um, uh, research and um, uh, jobs that require um, kind of accessing and, and, and collating uh, information. Um, uh, you know, yeah, so again, I think we could go we could go on uh, from there as well, and I hope in the the comments uh, we, that we have time to. Uh, but this idea that there is a separation between like a professional class and a working class is largely bullshit. Um, there's there are different exploitation looks different ways. Um, there are different ways that uh, people are. Um, compelled uh, to work, but at the end of the day, it's always uh, the same reality that we have to sell our labor power to put food on the table and a roof over our heads. Um, the last thing I'd like to kind of bring in here um, as a, a question is, so I just talked about the kind of the proletarization of these professional jobs, the imposition of um, a working class framework of exploitation on them. Uh, the drawing people into the working class. There's also another process um, that is going on, I think, um, that has to do with the, the cultivation of a professional culture. And I use that in a, in a very derogatory way in a certain sense, of a professional culture in uh, work as a whole. So when I talk about professional culture, um, it's one that's uh, very individualistic, Right, so the, these jobs 
that we label professional are um, ones where uh, the emphasis is usually on the individual uh, worker rather than on um, um, a group of workers. So the, uh, an increased sort of attempt to make workers identify individually, um, and that includes uh, making uh, people's pay dependent on performance. So you get rid of a standardized wage scale, um, and everybody is suddenly everybody's like an executive trying to compete for a for a, a share of a bonus at the end of the year. Um, uh, um, another uh, aspect of this professional culture is this um, demand uh, for constant sort of surveillance of of one worker by another and giving feedback to one another and giving so-called feedback on other workers to uh, you know to your boss, your manager um, that tends to all those things are are very contrary to solidarity and they are, are are a direct attack on what I talked about in the in the previous session where capital brings us together because it needs to it needs us it needs us working together but it also is trying to divide us and part of this is the uh, professionalization of of office uh, or of workplace uh, culture um, and this extends you know I've um, I should say this presentation is not just uh, my work. Uh, I worked on it with another comrade, Kay, uh, as well, who unfortunately was unable to make it today. Uh, Kay shared some of their experiences as a software engineer. I've also heard similar things from people in retail. So someone working at a Verizon store talking about, you know, having a sit down with their uh, manager about, you know, whether they were going to get the portion of their pay that was uh, set aside as a bonus. Um, so this is something I think that's, widespread um, and that we should uh, pay attention to. Um, on the upside, um, with the the mass layoffs in the tech industry recently, with uh, the Writers Guild uh, strike, um, I think there's a lot more attention uh, coming to these issues and I hope we can continue this discussion. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Scott. We will now open the floor for discussion. Um, Eric? Our, we do have a, a person who's joining us um, and he is in training and so he is going to um, test his uh, skills at moderating. You ready, Eric? I'm ready. All right, go on. Okay, thank you, Dee, um, and thank you to our presenters, uh, Lori, Taryn, and Scott. Let's begin with Peggy. Okay. Well, congratulations to Dee and Eric for unleashing these wonderful young people. I'm thrilled. Um, I, I really just want to congratulate um, this vigorous young force uh, and, and, I, and, um, and offer one something that I found very useful uh, myself. And I didn't really hit on it until I started working with artists who complained so much about having being ripped off that they were never paid the full value. And I finally began to use the distinction between labor and work. And in the languages of most industrial societies, there are two words for labor and work. And I, I won't belabor this, but uh, I sort of reduced labor as boss time for pay, which is usually the which is the same as most forms of work, uh, and often for the same purpose. But work may be unbossed and unpaid, um, as in uh, people talk about uh, they just do this to uh, this is their gig. They just do this to make a living. But their real art, their real work is such and such, or their real science is not what they have to do in order to, because they don't have the grant, so they have, that's my son, he has to do a lot of labor for other people in order to have access to do his real science. Um, and if, I think as we make, as we enter this new work, this world, um, 
the struggle will be more and more for boss for the boss time for pay to to reduce the amount of labor hours the reduce the amount of time that you have to work in order to submit to a boss in order to get paid but we do need that labor we can't dispense with labor because it really is the labor that makes us interdependent and civilized i, I could rant on but but thank you guys for where you are. Thank you, Peggy. Um, next, let's go to Dom. Uh, great presentation, everyone. It's really, really enjoyable uh, as I'm sitting here doing some homework. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, on something that Laurie said in the beginning, it's sort of tangential about uh, the media and the working class. And uh, something I had been thinking about the last couple of days is about how, um, you know, when, when uh, the professional athletes you know they have like a what they call a lockout you know really it's it's really a strike and it's something that was had been interesting interesting to me is that they never call it a strike they always call it a lockout but that's what it is it's a strike um and i think you know the next time that happens we we ought to you know some people might say well what do i have in common with a, a millionaire professional athlete but you know people look up to these you know to professional athletes and they're i think really really important to uh, you know, American culture. So I think, you know, next time, whenever this happens, that's something we might, you know, want to, you know, take uh, interest in is, you know, reframing it as like, you know, you're calling this a lockout, but really these workers, you know, are on strike. And I think that's something that might, you know, be interesting to us. Thank you, Dom. Let's go to Isaiah. Okay. Uh, so my question is, when fellow workers, uh, like voice frustrations about stuff that you know we all we all struggle with uh, but th they kind of fall into the trap of either blaming other sections of the working class or placing their hope for improvements in in bourgeois politicians how can we kind of redirect their frustrations while you know not i guess being on like a high horse you know while respecting their experience and their viewpoint how can we get across to them that if we want to to make effective change, uh, we need to do it through collective action and stop, I guess, kind of dividing ourselves into these arbitrary subgroups. Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Isaiah. Um, next, let's go to Emma. Um, Emma, I just unmuted your mic. Hey, um, actually, it's funny that the previous person brought up what he did bring up because I was going to make a comment just based off of my previous experience um, working in the labor movement. Um, I'm in the southeast and I had the opportunity to work with um, Raise Up for a short amount of time, um, Raise Up the South, which um, is how it sounds. The whole point is trying to push labor movements and encourage class consciousness in the south, which is a more difficult area. Um, but the main thing that I learned from that in terms of trying to get past that conflict as far as, you know, like the propaganda and the political brainwashing that's so prevalent in that area um, is really just connecting on the most basic levels that you can, just like kind of getting back down to the roots, like kind of reminding people of your shared humanity, like that we have the same struggles and that we are facing the same exploitation and just to kind of like make it personal and really connect with people to show that you're not just somebody who's spitting out ideas that they think are threatening or um you know something that's scary and unknown to them just kind of like reminding them that you're a person and they're a person and that you have the same struggles and the same needs and you know you're being oppressed by the same people thank you emma next let's go to mosin hi uh, i actually sent the question when the writing Basically, the question is the following. It is said that the, the, the next big, big revolution in, in production would be use of robotics, and that is going to make a lot of people unemployed. And that means a lot of people, there will fewer people buy things. At a, at a, at a meet, meet speech that Mark Zuckerberg gave at Harvard several years ago, he said, we will have to have a minimum com compulsory income for every every citizen in the, in the country. I want to know what the party position would be in such a case. Thank you, Mosin. Next, um, let's go to Carol. I think it's Kazu. Okay, Kazu, go on. All right. Um, I uh, remember talking 50 years ago 
in the YWLL and in the labor clubs that I was in about the difference between white collar and blue collar and what are we going to do with all these people that are no longer in uh, uh, factories. And I'm really excited by the discussion we're having um, in clarification. I mean, it's been clarified for years, but I'm excited hearing it through the Marxist classes. And um, now a couple of people have asked me, well, what about the people who were working, working with the working class who are blue collar workers or even white collar workers that were working, but now own their own business because of um, the, uh, the fact that people were not able to go to work. A lot of people were out of work and they've started home businesses. And, and well, even the people that are doing now groundwork or um, uh, people who are uh, own small buildings and that used to be their extra income and then they would go to their factories or work wherever. But now the money that they make is only um, from what they're receiving from the rentals that they own. So what part, I guess, I mean, I can guess, but the, how did, what side are they on? They're in the, they were working class, but now they're owners renting out and the people who are doing their own businesses and what have you. And if there's not a particular answer right now, it's something that we need to work towards in uh, understanding it. Uh, I don't know how to end it. I mean, the fact that they are not working at any production labor, but they're working for themselves and making money, but they're still working class before, had jobs before. And um, how do we present this to people? Okay. It's my question. Okay, thank you, Kazu. So now, Eric, can we turn it back to the, um, to the uh, presenters? Starting yes. with uh, starting with Lori, just yes. for you a few minutes of summary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. I really uh, appreciate the the discussion here and and the other uh, you know the whole the whole day. Um, I I guess I want to respond to um, Isaiah's uh, question and I really appreciate what Emma um, chipped in there about you know what do we say when fellow workers are voicing frustrations and they're blaming other segments of the working class or they're pinning their hopes on um, you know bourgeois uh, politicians and I just think it's such an important question I, I don't have a complete or final answer but something that's worked for me sometimes in labor context so you know co-worker context is the first point is you know they couldn't do it without us you know helping you know people recognize their power as the working class um d and bobby i think came up with that we we make it they take it we we make the thing you know they wouldn't be able to make a dime if we weren't doing what what we're doing th this work so as workers we have a lot of leverage um we can only use the leverage though if we're together if we organize as workers as a working class our strength is in our numbers and our unity and this is why it's so important you know to not get hung up on these um you know differences of you know, uh, preference or, or, or race or, or gender, you know, we have to be unified if we're going to be able to exercise our power. And, you know, sometimes it seems that in a, a certain kind of conversation, that progression of, 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 of thoughts um, can, can, you know, help somebody, you know, sort of, sort of uh, think about their, uh, their uh, position. And I also just would appreciate what John said. I'm not really familiar with lockouts or, or like sort of how that is or, or, you know, what how that works. But of the idea that, you know, yes, those are workers on strike. We are workers too, you know, and sort of making the common ground of being workers and being, um, you know, 
as big as we can, right? And and as as uh, uh, connected and unified as we can. So I guess that that's what I have to say. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Scott. Uh, yes, thank you um, to uh, for 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 the questions. Um, I wanted to I think specifically we take the one from um, from Kazu about um, maybe workers who uh, formed a, a small business or, or or work as a you know a small contractor or becomes become small landlords. Um, you know they are being squeezed as well, right? They were as as Kazu. Uh, pointed out in, in some cases squeezed out of jobs and that's that's why they you know came to rely on this other income um, and now they're being squeezed always by uh, bigger uh, businesses um, the question is what will they do under that pressure um, will they uh, will they punch down and try to ally themselves with um, with big capital or, or will they see where they're Sort of true interests lie, which is in uh, standing with the working class against um, these, against the big capitalists. In some sense, these folks are in the the, the weakest um, of all possible positions because they don't have um, like there's no there's no chance of them for competing, uh, no chance for them of competing with the big capitalists, and at the same time, um, they don't have the potential the vast potential strength of the working class that comes from solidarity and collectivity. Um, and yeah, that's, it, it's, a, it's a hard situation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Before we turn, oh, turn the mic back to uh, Taryn, let me call on Darius. Darius, did you have uh, a contribution that, a brief contribution that you wanted to make? There you are. Okay. Um, so real quick with the uh, gig economy, um, <clears throat> so, um, from what I was finding, um, gig economy workers aren't the best place to, um, try to attempt to find, um, solidarity or working class identity. Um, essentially they have, uh, origins in, um, the attempt to escape wage work and social mobility, um, as well as, um, other cultural contributing factors, um, that makes them not the best for that. Um, the best thing to do for them would be to emphasize the fundamental labor rights of all workers, respective of employment status, um, because they have um, partial unemployment or partial employment or unemployment, many of them working part time and um, definitely less than full time and typically as secondary jobs to uh, supplement their um, income, as well as they have a culture of uh, more rooted in ruling class ideology than individualist. Um, or then um, collectivist, and um, yeah. Um, so uh, for me, I see significant barriers in that in that instance to working class identity, um, and a lot more could be elaborated on further. But that's just uh, what I'm finding. Okay, thank you, Darius. Um, all right, Taryn. Thanks so much, everybody, for participating in this. Um, I think that, you know, to, to sum up a lot of what was raised by the participants, it's our job as communists to explain to people how it is that they're being robbed every single day as workers and how things like inequality uh, regardless if it's if it's gender or racial or you know people's nationality or their sexual orientation or their gender orientation or anything like that, these are all things that are standing in the way of workers understanding themselves to be part of the working class. And so you know I, I heard I heard what the comrade was saying about the high horse, and I'm from the south and I used to work in labor, and I think that the most frank way to encourage people to seek unity on the job is to say, why are you letting this keep you from having a pension? Why are you letting this keep you from having higher wages? Why are you letting this keep you from having dignity on the job? Like, is it really worth it to you to be able to hang on to these, you know, ignorant notions of race or gender or, or anything? Uh, is it worth it to you really? And to just sort of speak with people frankly like that, you know, I, I think that that 
there's there's a time and a place and obviously you know you're in your shop and you understand better what's going on there's a time and a place for trying to draw people you know out over many different conversations uh but then there's also a time and a place to just say hey cut the cut the bullshit you know like this is this is what's keeping us from from moving ahead so you know just yeah get your head on straight anyway thanks Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We invite you to join us Tuesday night for a class that will uh, uh, discuss the forces of production uh, and all of the ch and how the changes that uh, are taking place or have taken place and are taking place will affect us as the working class. On Thursday night, we will have a class discussing uh, the uh, class structure of the United States focusing on uh, the big capital and small capital. Then uh, Saturday, uh, we will conclude with a class in the morning, exploring a little more the special questions. Um, um, and, and there will be a presentation uh, that day, including um, a focus on youth and a focus on um, uh, 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 people of color. And then uh, lastly, uh, Saturday uh, afternoon, we will discuss um, uh, the uh, features and factors that uh, uh, draw us uh, into significant sim similarity across race, across gender, because of our conditions of existence as working class people. So um, again, thank you for participating in this uh, uh, work in progress. We hope uh, you're, you feel your time was well spent, and we hope we you will join us uh, in the future classes. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Eric. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Um, thank you again. Good day. Thank you, Dee. Thanks, everyone.